Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the first half of October. Oh guys, October has been such a good reading month for me such a good reading month. So I'm really, really excited about all the books that I have to talk about today. So in the first half of the month, I read 16 things. Yeah, I know. It's a lot. I've been reading a lot. But some really great stuff. Quite a few novellas, so a lot of shorter length things, which is part of why so many. It's been a whole lot of fun though. I've been getting a lot of reading done. I've been reading some spooky things. I've been reading some very amazing things like new books that I love. I finally broke my two month streak where I had no six star reads and six stars is what I give to my favorites of the year or favorites of all time. And I had two months in a row where I didn't have any. Streak is thoroughly broken. I'm also gonna say right up front, if you hear children in the background, I'm sorry, it's a rainy day. This is the time I have to film there in the apartment. So we're, we're just gonna go with it. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and dive in. If you are new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that I do these is I just talk about all of the books that I've read in chronological order. At the end of the month, I do my big wrap-up with all my stats and talk about books from lowest rated to highest rated, but for my mid-month wrap-up, I just talk about them in the order that I read them. But I am gonna start by talking about my DNFs. I think I have one of them. Let me double check and make sure I'm not forgetting one. Google Drive, where are you? Okay. Okay, I was wrong. I actually did have two DNFs. Both of them were relatively close to the beginning of the month. The first one I think is a case of a humor mismatch. I know other people like Marinez from My Name is Marinez really loved this book and I can see how if you like the sense of humor of the author you would love it but it just really wasn't for me. And this is Shit Actually by Lindy West. It's basically a send-up of popular movies where she kind of has snarky things to say about them. I think for me there were two problems. Number one, a lot of her humor just didn't really land with me. I wasn't finding it to be super funny. I don't think that's because other people don't think that she's funny because clearly they do. I think I just don't have the same type of humor as her. Also, I don't watch that many movies anymore, so some of the movies she was talking about I'm less familiar with. It's a book I was listening to. I was kindly offered a copy from Libra FM as an audio influencer copy, but the whole point of a book like this is to laugh. And so if I'm not finding it entertaining, why am I reading it? I decided to just go ahead and DNF it. I made it 30% of the way into this one before DNFing it. Again, not for me, but your mileage is really going to vary. It's the sort of thing where if you have the same sense of humor as her, it's probably great. It just didn't work for me. So that was unfortunate. I do have a couple of her other more political books on my TBR and I want to give them a try because I think those I might get along with better because of the project of the topics she's covering. This one was really more just for fun and primarily about the humor and I think that's a lot of why it didn't work for me. So then if you saw my wrap up from last month you might know that I thought kissing the coronavirus this very, very badly written erotic short story <laughs> that I read because people were talking about it. It was very poorly written, but it was hilarious and it made me laugh a lot. And so Amazon recommended to me a newer iteration that clearly was trying to jump on the bandwagon of the fact that that one took off. And I decided to give it a try. As you can tell, I ended up DNFing it, so it wasn't great. This is Courting the Coronavirus by Lee Taylor. Um, I read like eight pages of this one and I DNF'd it and returned it. I didn't like it. It was just kind of gross and misogynistic and not funny. The first one was not well written, but it was tongue in cheek and self aware and funny. Whereas this one I think was trying really hard to capitalize on that. But yeah, this one is like a historical time travel take on weird coronavirus erotica and I wouldn't recommend it. So, all right, with that said, let's go ahead and talk about all of the books that I did finish reading this month. 
The first thing that I read was one of my most anticipated books of the year. This is Each of Us a Desert by Mark Oshiro. Mark is the author of Anger is a Gift, which I really, really loved. And this is their first YA fantasy story, which I was really curious about. There was a lot that I really loved about this. It's very interesting and very poetic. I loved the world building. And I really, really loved the first half of this book in particular. It sucked me in and the pacing was really good. I do think the pacing slows down significantly significantly in the later part of the book and I didn't love that quite as much but I think a lot of this is really beautiful. It's the sort of book though that's a little bit difficult to describe because it's kind of complicated and I almost think you should go into this not knowing too much but the main character is a teen girl and it's in a desert type setting. There's a lot of Latinx influences on the language and the culture. There's a lot of Spanish woven into this. And what's interesting about it is the entire narrative is basically a prayer. So this girl is telling her story to this deity and it's very complicated. Um, her, her relationship with the deity and the things that have happened, there are magical and creepy things that happen throughout this. There are definitely content trigger warnings, so check those if you need them. I have a bunch, I have quite a few of them in my Goodreads review. But this is interesting because it's exploring identity and family and the expectations that families and communities might place on you and how you grapple with those. It's also about faith and belief and deciding what you believe or if you believe what your family raised you to believe but in this fantastical world so yeah this is very brutal at times and i think how much people love this is going to number one depend on whether they get along with the style but also may depend on how they respond to the philosophical direction that the ending of the book chooses to take i don't want to say too much about it because of spoilers I'm glad this book exists and I think this is going to hit home for a lot of people who might feel very connected to what this book is doing. I think for me, I didn't love the philosophical direction of the ending and that part of it I think is just not for me, but that did slightly bring down my rating, which is why I decided to give each of us a desert four stars for a while. I thought, oh, maybe this will be a new favorite. Not so much for me, but I could see how it could be for some people and then other people will not get along with it. It's an interesting book and it's one that's difficult to talk about, but I'm really glad I read it and I think there's a lot that's beautiful about this and about the worlds that Mark created. I think it's an impressive first attempt at a fantasy and especially moving from a contemporary novel into a fantasy, that's not an easy thing to do. One other thing to note is Mark is Latinx and queer and always centers queer characters and so the main character in the story is queer and there is a low-key sapphic relationship that develops. It's not a primary part of the story but it is in there so if you're looking for that that's another thing. So again uh, four stars for each of us a desert. I'm glad I read it. Not as much of a favorite as I might have hoped but I think a really strong book. Then I read a book that guys this was so freaking good. I I love it. This is everything that I wanted. This is what I wanted one to watch to be and some of you maybe saw my rant about how mad I was but I read Spoiler Alert by Olivia Dade. Oh guys I loved it so much. It's so freaking good. Um, so clearly after I, I read an e-arc of it and then I immediately was like well I'm, I'm clearly buying a copy of it and it came out so I now own a copy. First of all can we appreciate the cover? It's got a beautiful cover. This is the kind of fat rep that I want in my romance novels. This is the best of its kind that I have ever found. I think it's just so well done and I loved everything about this story. It's surrounding fandom. It's got a lot of tropes that I love. It's got great representation. I just thought this was fantastic and it immediately made me need to go and buy some more Olivia Dade backlist and read more of her work. And actually another thing that I love about this is the characters are a little bit older. They're not in their 20s. Our heroine I think is 36 and the hero is about to turn 40 so you're getting people a little bit later in life and 
really good in their careers, which is great. The heroine works as a geologist, but she also writes fanfic for a show that she loves. And even though I haven't really watched it since reading more reviews, I've come to discover that it's very clearly based around Game of Thrones fandoms is kind of what this is pulling from. So if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you might enjoy that aspect of it. It's very clear that the author knows a lot about fanfic and how that world works. It's, it's a lot of fun. So she works as a geologist, she also writes this fanfic, and for reasons she ends up getting to go on a date with one of the actors on the show that she loves and writes fanfic about. Except his secret is that he actually writes fanfic too, and she doesn't know that they know each other from that world and it's just really really great it's really fun also we have a hero who has dyslexia and that's explored quite a bit in the story which i love a lot it deals with having toxic families and how you manage those relationships and deal with the lingering effects of growing up in toxic families there's just a lot to love here i definitely want to read more from olivia dade and it, the representation of our main character was just fantastic. I, I really loved it. This was exactly what I wanted to see. She has moments of insecurity for sure, but in general she feels good about herself, she likes her body, she feels confident. This, this was what I wanted. Um, this was not what I got in <laughs> One to Watch, but the, this was what I wanted. I loved it. So with all of that said, I'm sure you'll be shocked to know that I gave this six stars. Yeah, I mean, who are we kidding? Of course I gave this six stars. I loved it. Definitely one of my favorite books that I've read this year. A new favorite romance and guys, it's so, it's just, this, this was catnip for me. I loved it so much. Then I listened to a audio influencer copy from Libro FM. Again, I have a link for them down below. They're a really great platform if you are an audiobook listener and the proceeds from using them go to support indie bookstores, which I am definitely a fan of. And so every month I get access to a handful of books that I can download. The next one that I read is Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of Everything by Raquel Vasquez Jaliland. Okay, so this is a really interesting book and I loved it, but I can see why it wouldn't necessarily work for everybody because it is a bit of a genre mashup in a way that not everybody might love. I was a big fan of it. It is a debut YA novel that is basically YA contemporary coming of age story meets Roswell, like aliens. It's, it's great. It's this great genre mashup. It has a lot of the same sort of tropes and ideas that you see often in YA contemporary novels, but then also reads kind of like a love letter to the X-Files, and it's, it's fun. I liked that mix, and I actually liked the way that it was using those elements. So this is a book following a teen girl whose mom had been an undocumented immigrant, who had been caught by ICE and sent back and then trying to return to them died. And so it deals with grief and loss of a parent. That's a big theme in this book. And it's dealing with issues of racism and immigration and how we handle that. It's also very sex positive. It's got sex on the page and what it looks like to engage in a healthy sexual relationship after experiencing trauma and sexual assault and I thought that was done brilliantly well. This is one too at the beginning of the audiobook it's got all of the trigger warnings which I appreciate that it has. I just thought this was beautiful. I found the writing to be really poetic. I liked the direction that the story took. It's a little bit of a slow burn so the pacing is slower. A lot of the more alien stuff trickles in until you get later in the story which some people seem not to like or they just didn't like that it had the alien stuff at all. I loved all of it and I think if you read closely and read between the lines you can see it slowly building through the beginning of it with the X-Files references and stuff it's really fun but I think what's interesting about this is the fact that it's dealing with immigration and it's using this play on words right that the word alien can mean you know somebody from outer space but we also use the word alien to describe describe immigrants. And I think this is using it as an opportunity to talk about the way those things can parallel in terms of violence and trauma and 
being an outsider and the way that those things are handled. So I really, really liked this a lot. I gave it five stars and I hope more people will pick it up. I haven't heard a whole lot of people talking about this one. Then I read Bonds of Justice by Nalini Singh. This is like book seven or eight, I think, in the Psy Changeling series. And uh, I, like, I can't say that much about it because it's so far into a series. But if you haven't read these before, they're really good. They're urban fantasy, but really with a sci-fi element to them because they're set in a futuristic world where humanity has diverged into the Psy who have these psychic abilities but have done things to turn off their ability to feel emotions and the changelings who are able to transform into other animals so they're sort of shifters but for scientific reasons and then humanity and it's wonderful in terms of the world building the overarching plot structure there's like larger mysteries and political machinations that are at play throughout the series which I love and it keeps me reading even if I don't always love the individual relationships because each book focuses mostly on a single relationship but you have this larger plot structure and other characters coming back in throughout. The heroine is a J Psy, a Justice Psy, which is a new type of, type of Psy we're being introduced to, and the hero is a cop with some psychic abilities. And I generally liked this one. I didn't have a ton of complaints about it. It wasn't a favorite of mine for the series, but I did give this one four stars and I'm excited to continue on. Then I had one that was a little bit of a disappointment and in this case I think there was something here that could have been great but it really needed more development and maybe a few more rounds of edits. It's a book that was sent to me for review by an indie author. This is The Last Angel Warrior by John W. Wells III, book one in the Caleb Andrews Chronicles. So this is supposed to be kind of a YA urban fantasy type story with a kid who's been adopted and then nearing his 16th birthday discovers that maybe he's not who he thought he was and on the back of the book it mentions his parents trying to kill him, which I don't know why that's on the back of the book because it doesn't happen until really late in the story, but it, it is part of the story. And so it's got these this interesting world. So here's what I really liked about the book. It feels very cinematic. I think the action scenes are written really well. A lot of it is pretty fast paced and easy to read, although there are some pacing problems at different points. And I think the world is really interesting. You get some solid world building and unpacking of what is the magic system and what is the history of that. And it's really interesting. It's clear that a lot of time and thought from the author went into that. The places where this is lacking are number one character development and the characters really needed some work. They kind of feel like stereotypes or placeholders more than really fully developed people and I didn't love that. It felt a little flat. There's also some big plot holes that take place in here, especially near the end, that I think needed to be explained or corrected in some way. And the other big thing about this is I'm not sure who to recommend this to exactly. It's pitched as YA, but it reads more like middle grade, except for the fact that some really intense stuff happens, like really pretty dark and traumatic stuff, and yet the, and yet the trauma of those things is never really addressed or felt. It's kind of glossed over like it's not a big deal. So I don't know. I don't know. That's odd. I, I sometimes see that happening in middle grade books where darker and traumatic things are not fully, or you don't, they don't fully dive into more dark and traumatic things that happen. As a YA though it really needs to grapple with it and I also feel like some of the things that happen maybe are too dark for a middle grade so I don't know this is something where I feel like this has the bones of something that could be really cool but it just needed more work and so I ended up giving this one two and a half stars. Hopefully future books will be able to correct some of those things. Next I read another e-arc from Neck Alley. This was Over the Woodward Wall by A. Deborah Baker aka Sean and McGuire. So this is a novella that came out from Tor.com and it's connected with her book Middle Game. It's actually a children's story that is mentioned in that book. So this was really interesting. I generally did enjoy my time with it. First of all, if you're wondering if you have to have read Middle Game to be able to read Over the Woodward Wall, I would say no, you don't have to. You can easily read it on its own and you don't need to know anything going in. It's it's It feels more kind of like a scary middle grade level story that's much more akin to Shauna McGuire's Wayward Children series. So I think if you like the Wayward Children series and you want something that might be a little more appropriate for a younger audience with younger characters, 
this is a good one to pick up. It's got a lot of similar vibes and so I enjoyed my time with it. It is interesting because I did read Middle Game. I didn't love Middle Game. It's probably one of my, <laughs> my least favorite books that I have read from her. Not because I hated it. I just, I, I just thought it needed some things fixed in it, but I thought the concept was interesting. It does some interesting parallels with the plot of Middle Game, but more in a representative way, not in a direct way. So they're set in two different worlds, different characters. You could read it by itself. I did enjoy it and I gave this one four stars. Then I listened to Brazen and the Beast by Sarah McLean. This is I think book three in her Bare Knuckle Bastards series. Book two. Okay, book two in the Bare Knuckle, book two in the Bare Knuckle Bastard series, and I liked this. I think this is actually my best experience that I've had with Sarah McLean so far. Both of the other two books that I read from her, it, like, I was, it was the sort of thing where I felt like, on paper, I should really like everything about it, but something about it just isn't quite working for me. And this one was much better. I just got along better with the hero and heroine. I liked the romance. Uh, the heroine is really funny, too. She is certainly brazen, is gonna go after what she wants, and she wants to be taken seriously as a businesswoman. Their father's determined to leave the business to her lazy, lackadaisical brother, even though she's actually the one running most of the business stuff. And so what's interesting is the book opens with her getting into her carriage and finding this man tied up in there who ends up being the hero and that's a little bit complicated and interesting but she's getting in her carriage to go to a brothel that services women because she wants to ruin herself so that she can prove to her father that she doesn't want to just get married and have babies she wants to take over the business and uh yeah so i really liked this sarah mclean writes more feminist historical romance and i liked this one i thought it was pretty good i read it partly because i was hoping there would be some good fat rep in it because the main character is plus size and also very tall she's a tall plus size woman it was fine. Like, it's nice to at least see the representation there, and it wasn't necessarily bad, but a lot of it was her feeling self-conscious about the fact that she didn't wasn't beautiful and didn't meet society's standards of what she should look like, and the hero telling her that he disagreed and he thought she was really attractive. So it, you know, it was fine. It wasn't necessarily my favorite version of this kind of representation, but it is there, and I appreciate that it's there, and I love that the cover heroine looks that way, which is cool. So uh, I ended up giving Brazen and the Beast four stars. Okay, then I read another e-arc of a book that I had to go out and buy a finished copy of. It just came out and it is a debut novel. This is Beyond the Ruby Veil by Mara Fitzgerald. This is a queer YA dark fantasy and it's so good. It's so freaking good and it's such a page turner. I couldn't put it down and I'm kind of obsessed with it. This is though the sort of book that not everybody is going to like because the main character is a very unlikable female character. I mean she kind of is but I sort of love it. She's very ambitious, she's pretty self-centered and can get really brutal. This is a pretty like bloody violent book so if you need content warnings, check them. Uh, but I don't want to tell you too much about the plot because this is the sort of book that I think it's best to go in not knowing too much. The twists and the turns and the super slow burn beginnings of a sapphic hate to love romance that's in here. It's, I will say going into this because I think some people are going into this hoping that's the center of it. That is not the central part of this story. The, the central story is something else but the main character is only interested in women and there is the start of a hate to love kind of of a like a hate to love relationship yeah i loved it this also sometimes crosses the line over into horror it has some horror elements to it but it's definitely a fantasy and i finished it and i was like where is book two i need book two now thank you yeah I, I can't say anything else, but this was not what I expected. I loved it. It's not a very long book either. So like it won't take you that long to finish. It's uh, yeah, less than 300 pages. So like 200 and about 280 pages long. I flew through it. I could not put it down. I'm completely obsessed. 
if you liked, um, I would highly recommend this for fans of Forest of a Thousand Lanterns by Julie C. Dow. If you liked that, you will probably love this. So six stars again. Yeah, another favorite of the year. Um, it's freaking awesome. And one hell of a debut novel, guys. One hell of a debut novel. I loved it. It was great. So yeah, I bought it. Also, if you hear a really annoying banging noise in the background, that's our radiator because it's like winter and then I don't know why, but the radiator makes these weird noises. It's, it's a whole thing. We're just going to go with it today. It's fine. All right. So then I finally, after two years of having it on my TBR, I finally read Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is the first book in her Sixth World series. And it's really, really interesting. It's post-apocalyptic urban fantasy centering a Native American woman who is a monster hunter. And I really enjoyed this. This is one that I had tried reading like a year ago and I think just wasn't in the right frame of mind. And so I kind of put it aside until I was ready for it. I really enjoyed it this time around. It definitely gets pretty dark. I think the world that Rebecca Roanhorse has created is really interesting. She's got a lot of really interesting commentary on different things coming out through it. And yeah, in general, I enjoyed my time with this. I am excited to read more. I will say sometimes the experience of reading Maggie as the main character could be really really frustrating because of the choices that she makes and the ways that she responds to people at times. That said, I understand why. A lot of it is coming from her PTSD, from trauma that she experienced as a child, among other things. And so I get it, but it is sometimes a little bit frustrating to read. And this book gets quite dark. There's another thing too that I was kind of uncomfortable with, the way that it was handled. So she was orphaned as a kid. I, pro I, don't, it, I don't remember exactly. I want to say she was around 12 or so. And then she was essentially adopted or fostered by this demigod monster hunter and then trained under him and we see her now as an adult woman who's been abandoned by him and is still kind of carrying a torch for him and I, I wasn't super comfortable with the way that it handled her wanting a romantic or sexual relationship with the guy who also was like a father figure for part of her life yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily portrayed as healthy or positive, but I also didn't feel like it did enough to address it for me to be entirely comfortable with it. So just FYI, if you want to hear more or see more of the content warnings, check out my Goodreads review and my Goodreads is always linked down below. But I did generally like this. I'm excited to see where else this story goes and read more from Rebecca Roanhorse. And I gave Trail of Lightning four stars. Oh, gosh, I hope this is not so bad in editing, but seriously this drives me crazy every single year when the radiators get going it's like click 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 it makes these like banging noises so much I, why does it do that i don't know enough about radiators to know why it does that but it does and it's super annoying i don't know how much that's showing up on the camera but it's irritating me so i'm sorry um but i kind of need to film this today so Oh, well, at least I captioned these videos for you. Okay, so the next thing that I finished reading was The Merriest Magnolia by Michelle Major. This is a small town holiday romance. So if you're looking for that, this might be a good pick. I read the first book in the series earlier in the year and really, really loved it. And so I was excited to continue on. Each book in the series is following one of three sisters and their backstory is a little bit complicated. So I'm not going to get too much into that here. But this one is an enemies to lovers second chance romance where the main character is a woman who is an artist who's trying to bring life back into her small town after things her father did that really depressed it economically and her high school boyfriend who broke her heart is back in town and now is this big real estate developer and basically even though the word is not used in here is like a gentrifier basically and he wants to completely change the town and turn it into a playground for the elite pretty much. Also, he hates Christmas. So you've got some definite Scrooge vibes going on there. But he's back in the small town partly because he's now the guardian of a teenage boy and is struggling to figure out how to be a good father figure to this kid who is grieving the loss of his parents. So 
it's a romance between the two of them. They are enemies because they want different things for their small town, but it's also got a second chance romance element to it. One thing that I do really like about this is it's a holiday romance that really feels like a holiday romance. The holidays play a big role in it. It's got a lot about Christmas spirit. It's got this kind of Scrooge character having a transformation. And so this is legitimately a holiday romance. And I thought that was pretty good. The things that I didn't love so much about it is number one, I felt like the heroine was a little bit of a pushover. And I, I get that part of it is that her personality is different from mine. But frequently I was like, no, why are you being so easy on him and so nice to him? Like we need more of a grovel here. We need more of an apology. Like don't just like be fine. What? So that but that's like a me thing of what I need from it. I also felt like the ending was a little bit abrupt. I like more from my endings. I like an epilogue that shows us the couple together at the end afterwards for a while. I know not everybody feels that way but this one has a little bit more of an abrupt ending. So for those reasons I gave The Merriest Magnolia three and a half stars. Then I read another Tor.com novella. This was another e-arc that I had from NetGalley and this one is called Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark man guys <laughs> so this is interesting it's called a historical fantasy i would say that it's also horror it's like a historical fantasy horror basically it's kind of an odd little novella but i think it's really good and really really smart i don't want to tell you too much about it because spoilers and it's not terribly long but basically it follows a group of black women in the american south in the 1920s who hunt evil kkk members basically. And what's really interesting about this book is it weaves a lot of real history into the story, an impressive amount actually, but then uses this fantastical lens on it to offer different kinds of insight and different ways of thinking about race relations and the history of racism and slavery in America. And I just think it's really good. It's really smart. It's a very timely story. And I liked the way that it ended and pulled so many different pieces together. I don't want to say too much more than that because again, it's short and I don't want to spoil anything. Do know that there are a lot of horror elements to this. There are some more gruesome things, so check trigger or content warnings if you need them. But overall, I think this was really, really good. I've been a little back and forth on my rating. Initially, I gave it four and a half stars, but I think I want to bump it up to five stars just because I think the way that history is woven into it is so brilliantly done. So even though it isn't like a new favorite for me, I just think it's so well written and really, really smart and uh, definitely one worth checking out. So five stars for Ring Shout. I told you this was a great month, guys. It's been a great first half of the month for me. Then I read another book that's super good. Actually, when I first finished it, I was like six stars. And I'm like, okay, maybe not quite. It's still for sure five stars, but it didn't quite hit that point, but, but real close, guys. This was really, really close. I'm not terribly surprised. I read Crazy Stupid Bromance by Lissa K. Adams. This is book three in the Bromance Book Club series. And I loved it. Hands down my favorite of the series so far. So this one is a slow burn friends to lovers story that is just done really well. And if you guys haven't read the series yet, do yourself a favor and pick them up. I know they're really hyped, but they're so good, especially if you like meta commentary on the romance genre because all three of the books just do that so well. I was living for this. It's got a nerdy hero. It's a takedown of toxic masculinity. It's doing a lot of stuff and I just loved everything about it. It made me so happy. I love the balance that Lissa K. Adams has of this meta commentary but then also really real emotions and and dealing with very real to life issues that people go through with each other and with their families. And yeah, the development of the relationship felt really believable to me. I was a fan, easy five stars for sure. Then I read The Hellion by S.A. Hunt. This is book three in the Malice Domestica series. It's a paranormal horror series written by a trans woman who is former U.S. military, which I think puts a really interesting spin on this. This is solidly horror though. You need to know going in, there's lots and lots and lots of content trigger warnings in this entire series. There's a lot of really gruesome violence and various horror things in it. So just kind of know that check content warnings, trigger warnings, if you need them. This one is interesting because it's book three in the series. The first two books wrapped up a plot arc. And so I was curious to see where this one was going to go. It 
kind of takes our main character off in an RV with her disabled veteran boyfriend on adventures and they end up getting caught up in some dangerous supernatural stuff as per usual. So what I like about the series is that it brings much needed diversity into horror and centers people that it often doesn't. It consistently pushes back against misogyny and toxic masculinity and homophobia, not to mention racism, especially in the first two books. I do feel like racially this one was less balanced. The characters felt much less balanced to me in terms of like good versus evil with people of color than previous installments did, and I think that maybe could have been handled a little bit better, but still I think it's it's doing things that maybe not so many people are doing in the genre right now which is is worth checking out. What's interesting about this book is it's attempting to address issues of domestic violence through horror which I really like conceptually. I like the idea of using horror as a way of talking about truly horrific things. In this case Robin who's the heroine she's a punk youtuber and witch hunter hunt switches on her YouTube channel and she ends up getting caught up with this family and extended things where there's stuff going on. And the antagonist is a guy who is violent. He's a domestic abuser. There is a very intense scene of domestic violence early on in this book. So again, check content warnings. It was very, it was a lot. It was difficult to read. What's interesting about his character is he already had toxic things and violent tendencies and then for magical reasons became sort of possessed I guess you could say and that just made things much worse. So it's an interesting take on dealing with that trope. I didn't love the resolution of that plot line and the way it was handled. Some quibbles with this but in general it's an interesting series. It is pretty intense horror. It's very gruesome which is not my favorite brand of horror but I did give this one three stars and if that's your thing it's worth checking out. Say hello. Hello. And I, and I really have Roger. The do not be. I do want to to get Dory look on. Soon you're going to be four years old. That's true. All right. Say bye. Say bye, people. I don't see it, people. I know, but they'll see it later. Say bye, people. Bye, people. Okay. Okay. Then I read another ERC, and this was just so much fun. It was like perfect read for October. It's The Haunting of Beatrix Green by Rachel Hawkins, Ash Parsons, and Vicki Alvier Schechter. This is really interesting. It's coming out through Serial Box in episodes and the e-arc that I had had all of the episodes in one and it reads basically like a novella when you have them together like that so it's not terribly long but I just thoroughly enjoyed this. It's basically a gothic horror haunted house story with a bit of romance thrown in and it was delightful. It was delightfully spooky. It didn't get super super scary although there were a few more disturbing gruesome scenes so do know that going in. But it's set in Victorian England and the main character is a woman who earns her livelihood as a medium but doesn't actually believe in ghosts. So when a man offers her a lot of money to come and either prove or disprove the existence of ghosts at this supposedly haunted estate she quickly says yes of course. But they get there and maybe ghosts are more real than she thought they were. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. I, it was fun. It had twists and turns and a little bit of romance. I really enjoyed it and it was kind of the perfect short read for this time of year. I gave this one four stars. All right, two more things to talk about. As you can see, I did read quite a few novellas. So part of why I was able to get through so much in the first half of the month is I had a lot of shorter works that I was reading. But the next thing that I read was Once Upon a Winter's Eve by Tessa Dare. This is a historical romance novella set around the holidays and I'm reading this to discuss with some of my patrons. I was in the mood for like some holiday romances and so I was like hey let's just like read a novella together and this was the one we voted on. Unfortunately I didn't love it. I usually really like Tessa Dare a lot. This one I think the main problem with it honestly was the length. For me given the conflict between the hero and heroine, I really needed more time for healing and repairing their relationship. It's a second chance romance, some good ideas with like spies and different languages and whatever, but I feel like the hero did some really really horrible things and, and very badly wrong to the heroine and she's just like so quick to forgive him and things are just magically fine and it's a very very short novella. So this needed to be either a much 
meteor novella or a full-length novel I think for it to work at least for me. So for those reasons I gave Once Upon a Winter's Eve two and a half stars. And the final book that I have to share with you guys in this video is one that I finished listening to this morning actually I was right near the end of it and that is Home Before Dark by Riley Sager. This is our Patreon book club pick of the month and my first time reading Riley Sager which was very exciting. I freaking loved this so much. <laughs> it was great. It was so great. If you guys saw I recently did this huge recommendation video of all these gothic books to read because I love gothic books. I'll link it up above if you haven't seen it yet. But this is exactly that. This is everything that I love about gothic horror. This is a gothic horror haunted house story set in the modern day and it's just everything that I love about the genre and it's so well done. I think fans of the Netflix adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House would really love this a lot. It has a lot of similarities and definitely feels like he drew some inspiration from it but it's its own thing like the ending is very different and the direction things take are very different. So the setup for this is an interesting one. The main character is a woman who grew up with all of this notoriety because her father wrote this best-selling memoir of of her family's time spending 20 days living in a haunted estate they had purchased before leaving and vowing never to return again. And all of this happened when she was five years old. She has no memory of what happened during that time and doesn't believe in ghosts, believes it's all just a pack of lies that her father made up. Now she's an adult, her father has passed away, and she's inherited this house that she hasn't been back to since she was five years old. And she's determined to go back, renovate it for sale, and while she's there, uncover the truth of what really happened. So the narrative structure of this, I think, works really, really well. The way it's set up is you have a chapter from her father's book, and then a chapter of what's happening right now. And it does a nice job of paralleling creepy things happening, because of course, she gets back there and weird things start to happen. And it's like, oh, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe it is true. And it takes a lot of interesting twists and turns. It does that gothic thing that I really like of this old, creepy, isolated house, with where you don't know for sure if things are real, if there's an explanation for them, if they're all in their head, or if there's truly paranormal things happening. And at different points in the book, I was convinced it was going to be one or the other. It kept me guessing, and I loved, I loved it. I loved all of the twists and turns, and endings like that for books like this are always hit and miss for people. I really liked the way that it handled stuff. I will for sure be reading more from Riley Sager. This is exactly what I hoped it would be, and it is a book that I'm giving six stars. So another favorite of the year. And uh, yeah, so three, guys. <laughs> three six star reads just in the first half of the month. Like when has that happened? It's very exciting. I've got to tell you, I'm thrilled. I have been loving most of the things that I've been reading this month and I have more things on deck that I have high hopes for. So who knows? Like what a great month for reading. It's very exciting. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything that I talked about today. And for your question of the day, let me know what you're reading for October. Are you reading anything creepy, anything spooky, um, any good gothic stuff? I, I've been loving all, all the gothic things. Just give them all to me. I will gladly take them and it makes me very, very happy. <laughs> Talk to me in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.